Good evening. This evening we're going to be studying about how to read the Bible. Now the material that we'll be talking about and discussing this evening actually comes from an article that's written by Jared Jackson and discussing nine rules for effective Bible reading. I felt like that information could be very beneficial to us, so I decided to put that into lesson format and present that information to us. How to read the Bible and to make it the most beneficial for us as we read the Bible. But before we go there and look at those rules, we want to ask the question, is the Bible reading important? Is it significant? Is there any importance in reading the Word of God? I want to let us go to the Bible and the Scriptures themselves will answer this question as to whether it is important for us to be reading our Bibles and whether reading the Scriptures has any significance whatsoever to us and to anyone else for that matter. Let's go to the Bible and see. Who needs to be reading the Scriptures? Well, the Bible itself says that the king was called to read the Scriptures. Even the kings were commanded. If you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18 through 20, here we can see that the one that was sitting upon the throne was the king, and he was to have a special copy of the Scriptures. His own copy. Separate from the one that the Levites had, he was to have his own. And the Bible says that he was to read it all the days of his life. Well, why is this? Well, the king was to learn to fear the Lord God. To be careful to observe the, all the words of his law, all the statutes, and that's the reason why. So there's not, there's not anyone that can say, well, it's not really important to read the Bible. Even our elected officials need to be reading the Bible. Even the, the president needs to be reading the Bible. Though you may have made it to the top in, in the country in political status, even you, even the Queen of England, needs to be reading and studying the Holy Scriptures. And we can see that even in the Old Testament law, that was a part of that law. In Exodus chapter 24, we see that the Scriptures have been read aloud for many years and for many ages and many dispensations for the benefit of various groups of people in Exodus chapter 24. Here we have Moses, and he has received the information from God, the, the laws and the precepts from God. And in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 24, it says, Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of all the people. He read it in the hearing of the people. The people responded in, in this instance in a very positive manner. They said, all the Lord has said to do, we will be obedient. We're going to do it. We will do it. We'll be obedient. And so then you find this covenant entered in between those individuals and the Lord with those words. It's significant that over and over when something like this happens, and even here at the picture of Sinai, when they're there and they're receiving this, that this information was presented before the people. They were instructed. It was read before them. In Deuteronomy 31, we also see again, in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 9, So Moses wrote this law and delivered to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. We know that in that, that the Ark of the Covenant, there was the, the Ten Commandments, the tables, uh, written in stone. And then not only that, but you had what we would consider the Law of Moses, the books of the Law. That information was there as well. And it says in verse 10, And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at this appointed time, in correspondence and with the Feast of Tabernacles, that they were all to be gathered together. And notice in verse 11, he says, you shall read this law to who? 
before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men, women, even the little ones, the stranger, even in your gates, that they may hear and may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully to observe all the words of this law. So was it important? Was it important for them to hear the dictates, the commands, the statutes, the will of God? Was that significant? Was it important? Absolutely. So much so that every seven years, they set every single one of them down and said, you're going to listen to every single word. Every word. No excuse. Oh, that's a great practice, I think. Every seven years, we're going to all sit down. We're going to hear every word. That's what they did. And you know that you can ask the question, well, was it important? Oh, absolutely, it was important. And Joshua, you read the great leaders, you have Moses as one great leader, and then you come to Joshua in Joshua chapter 8 and verse 34 and 35, as Moses laid down what we would call his baton as he passed on, and then another leader came over and, and took over his place, and that was Joshua, uh, the great conqueror of the land, Joshua, that great leader. In Joshua chapter 8 and verse 34, it says, And afterward he read all the words of the law. All the words of the law. And he didn't leave anything out. He read all the blessings. He read all the cursings. According to all that is written in the book of the law. Verse 35. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel. Again. Who's there? Well, you've got the, got the women, the little ones. You've got the men, of course, that are assembled, the strangers that were living among them. They were all there. And Joshua, as another one of those great leaders, made sure that they heard the words of God. That's how important God's instruction is and has been throughout all the ages. You come to Nehemiah chapter 8. And even beginning there in, in verse 1, it says, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe, what they tell him? Well, bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And so Ezra did that. Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding. And again, he read from it. So we, you look back and, and, and going through each cycle of great leaders, you've got Moses, you've got Joshua, and now you have other great leaders that are here, among them Ezra and Nehemiah, great leaders of God. And they're making sure that those individuals have heard and understand the truth of God's Word. And even in this text, when you read down in verse 12, they rejoiced greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. You see, it's important. God's Word is significant. It holds value. It always has. And what kind of value do we place upon it? And through all the ages, there has been great value that has been placed upon it. And did you didn't hear in these texts the people whining and complaining and kicking and screaming because they had to be there too long. No. Why? Because the Word of God was being proclaimed. They were getting to hear the message from the God that they loved and they didn't do that. They rejoiced. Why? Because they had an opportunity to hear and to understand the will of God and what a blessing it is. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 21, it reminds us that even in the first century, when all those Jews were there, it was their practice that, that the law was read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And you knew where the law was being read. Every Saturday, you could go into one of those synagogues and guess what you would hear? You would hear the law being read before the people. That was their practice. It was important. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16, now when this epistle is read among you, you see, was it important when they wrote that when the Apostle Paul wrote that correspondence by the Holy Spirit to the church at Colossae, 
Was that correspondence important? Yeah, sure it was. Was it to be read before everyone? Absolutely. Absolutely. And not only that, but he said, now you need to read it and you need to make sure that it makes its way over to the other area congregations, Laodicea. As a matter of fact, you need to read the correspondence that I sent to Laodicea as well. You have a copy of that. Make sure that you read that before the congregation. Again, the reading of the Holy Scriptures. So vital, so important. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16. God's Word needs to be taught to families. We know that when we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, that we are to teach our children diligently when uh, we talk with them, when we walk with them by the way, when we sit down, when we lie down, when we rise up, when we, uh, at every setting, we have an opportunity then to proclaim and instill God's truths within them. And so God's Word has to be taught in family groups, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, what a blessing it was that Timothy had the opportunity. That even from the time that he was young, that he was able to know the Holy Scriptures that were able to make him wise into salvation. And what a blessing that was. That had been instilled in him. And he had a good mother and a good grandmother, as the Scriptures reveal to us, that blessed his life. They used the Scriptures, and made sure that they taught that young man. And so it is important that we do the same. The Scriptures must also be read individually. In Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2, it is our delight, that is the law of the Lord, in that we meditate both day and night, at least that's what the psalmist tells us to do. And we are to be just like that psalmist, like the tree that's planted by rivers of water that won't be moved, and we are to delight in the law of the Lord and meditate upon it day and night. The Word of God is important. The psalmist said in, in Psalm 119.11, Your Word have I hid in my heart. You know what that means? That psalmist has that personal responsibility in that process. He said, Thy Word, O God, have I hid in my heart he was involved in that process and you know what he took the word of god and he put it into his heart it was placed there it was chiseled into the stones of his heart in his mind that i might not sin against you psalm 119 105 thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path in acts chapter 8 you have Philip and you have the eunuch and he's there in that chariot and he's reading from Isaiah. What we understand, there are occasions where some people may be reading and they may need a little bit of guidance, they may need a little bit of help and so that's why we move into the rest of our lesson because we've, we've answered the question, is Bible reading important? Are the Scriptures valuable to us? and the reading of it, and the comprehension of it, and the understanding of it. Well, the answer is yes. Resounding, yes. But then there are some times where there are those that read and struggle. And they need assistance. He was one. And thankfully, there was one by providence that was there to help him. How can I accept some man should guide me? He needed a little help, a little guidance, so that he could fully understand. So what we want to do tonight, I want to give you some rules for effective Bible reading that can benefit every single one of us in our spiritual walk. First, we ought to read the Bible regularly. It's not a sporadic Bible reading or a haphazard Bible reading, but it's something that, that is done regularly. If it is haphazard, it's not going to be good enough. It's just not especially not to, to hide that word into our heart so that we don't sin against God. And so we need to make sure that we're doing this regularly and any child of God who has to be convinced that they need to be reading their Bible is already in spiritual peril. <laughs> They're already in trouble if you're having to convince somebody that says, I'm a disciple of Jesus, but I don't want to be a disciple of Jesus because a disciple is a learner. It's somebody that's constantly learning and studying and is at the as as a pupil 
is at the foot of the teacher, the master teacher. That's what we are as disciples. We are at the feet of the master, and we want more. We can't get enough. And so anyone who is not convinced that they need to be studying regular, they really need to make sure that they examine whether they truly are a follower of Christ. Because if we are, then we're going to want to put that word in our lives and in our mind so that we know God's will. So we ought to be reading the Bible regularly, but we also ought to be reading the Bible analytically. You say, you know, what, what do you mean by that? Well, we ought to be analyzing as we move through passages, and uh, it's not like we're just perusing through the articles in a newspaper, you know. Oh, that's a good headline. Uh, you know, just kind of going through it, thumbing through. Oh, that's nice. Mm, you know, like I pick up uh, National Enquirer. <laughs> oh, that's well, that's great. Mm -hmm. No, it's nothing like that. Not, not even close. We need to be studying the Word of God analytically. And God intends for us to understand the Bible. And so we ought to be analyzing the Word of God and the Word's that are there and the component parts so that we can better understand the whole of Scriptures and how it all fits together. And so that takes effort on our part. For example, we have to start off by understanding that there are different covenants, different testaments, and that certainly aids in our understanding of studying the Bible. And really that is the very beginning of understanding as we move forward. If we don't understand that, we're going to be troubled as we study throughout the text of the Bible. We have to understand, first of all, that there are those divisions and that we have to be willing to rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. But what there are a lot of other resources that can be beneficial as we study. Now for me, um, in the past, I've used a lot of uh, written material and books. Now, as technology has come along and been made available, I've moved the computer a little more, even though I still use and reference materials. And that's why we, you know, we're trying to build even more the church library so any, anyone, any member can utilize that, can access materials that might be able to help them. And the truth of the matter is that when you really start studying the minor prophets, you're going to have a hard time if you don't know the background and you don't know when it was written and you don't know what was going on. And if you can't connect that to the books of history, your head's going to start spinning. You're not going to, it's just not going to make sense. Well, any of the prophets for that matter, it's not going to, you're not going to be able to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And so what helps is to have those resources that, that help provide some of those dates and to give us a little bit of the background and kind of connect some of those, those places in the books of history so that we can go back and we can read and then we can know what was happening in history so then we can understand when the prophet is saying this, he's speaking to these people over here that are living through what the history is outplaying here in the books of history and, it, and it'll make a world, a world of difference in our Bible study. And so there are a lot of resources that we can use that can help us, some really basic ones like Haley's Bible handbook can be beneficial on occasion for different chapter summaries and things that can help us but there's a lot of different materials and resources and if you are ever interested feel free to ask and I will do my best to help you and point you in the right direction and uh, for me I use a lot of online resources and uh, they there you can go online there's Bible hub there's I use the Englishman's concordance and uh, Greek interlinear that is beneficial to me, and I use a lot of other resources. And you know what? They're free. Um, you know, there's a lot of people you can spend thousands of dollars on Bible material and Bible software, but a lot of that's free. And so you can utilize those free tools that are out there. And so for those that are computer savvy and have that capability, well, then there's a lot of resources for you to use. For those that do not, then there still are books that can help us as we study analytically, as we try to dig into God's Word. You know what I learn? Every time I study, I learn there's more to know. More and more and more. I study, I study, I study, and I am amazed at the depths and the unsearchable riches of God's Word. Every time I study. There's just so much more to mine, so much more to dig into, and so it is a, it is a wonderful endeavor. It's a lifelong endeavor as we 
try to dig in and understand the will of God as we try to draw closer unto God. We need to study the God's word analytically. We do it systematically, and I believe that's going to profit us more than doing it in any other way. And so a well-organized plan helps facilitate that. There's a lot of them. And so you can find uh, reading calendars, study aids. The, you can read through the Bible chronologically. You know, if you just pick up the Bible as it's laid out right now, you're not going to read it per se chronologically. Um, it's laid out in groups. And uh, you've got the books of history and you've got the, you've got, uh, the books of law and it's categorized that way. You've got the prophets that, that are together, uh, minor and major. It's, it's put that way for ease in some ways, but it's not in chronological order. So there are some reading schedules that are chronological, and that might be beneficial to you. But I would say you can try different ones at different times that might help you to grow. But a schedule, something that is systematic, we can take advantage of. I will caution you, uh, especially those that are, again, the young people, uh, often, my daughter comes to me, uh, a couple of different ones, different ones will ask me different times, what about this, Dad? And uh, they have, uh, there's about a thousand different apps that are out there on these phones, and they'll pull up an app, and what about this, this reading schedule? And I say, well, let me look into it. And I look at it, and it's denominational based, and then what I find is they're guiding my young people, my children, to passages that they want them to go to, and they're particularly and specifically missing other passages that they don't want children to read. And uh, so those are dangerous. So you just need to be careful. Uh, when I'm talking about systematically, I'm not talking about denominational material that will guide you where they want you to go. What I'm saying is something that covers the whole Bible, but it's systematic. I have one Bible reading plan that will allow you to read the New Testament in 30 days. It lays out how many chapters you read a day. It lays out the books. And for 30 days, you can set that schedule. You can read the entire New Testament 30 days. Something like that. They're not trying to, to, to pull the wool over your eyes or try to get you to believe one doctrine or not. It's just laying out in a systematic way how to read through the Bible. And same thing with a chronological order. Uh, you're still going to cover the whole Bible. It's just not going to be in order. And so they're not going to try to leave anything out. And so it's important that you understand the difference. And as you do this, just make sure that you take advantage of a method and that you work at it and work very hard to push through it. And so what you have to have is a, a, a pattern, a time of day, in which you can do so, which is un, in, uninterrupted for a lot of people, that is early in the morning. When they wake up early in the morning, uh, sometime before the sun has come up, for a lot of folks, they get up and that's their quiet time. And they have a chance to, to read and to study their Bibles. And uh, for a lot of folks, that's beneficial. For others, they're night owls and they will do it at night. Um, whatever works for you, but you choose that time that's uninterrupted and uh, you're able to then do this. It's not that you're trying to fit it into your schedule. Uh, we're saying that this is, you're reading and studying God's Word. This is important. And so you set that aside and that is a priority for you. The other thing that we need to do is we need to read our Bibles persistently. Sometimes Bible reading can be discouraging for some. You say, well, how can that be? How is it possible for somebody to be discouraged if they read the Bible? Well, it can be on occasion for new Christians. They can be overwhelmed. And they can get discouraged really quick because they don't understand everything. And as they begin to read and study through the Bible, and they, they, it's just not making any sense, and there's a lot of hard words and stuff they've never heard before, and stuff's not maybe connecting the way that they feel like it should, and they're trying to make through genealogies. I know a lot of people that, that they'll pick up the, the New Testament and they'll say, okay, I'm going to read through the Bible. And they'll say, well, they'll, I mean the New Testament. And so they'll pick up and they'll start in Matthew and they only make it through the first chapter and they're done because they've hit the genealogies and they're maybe there in Luke and they, they get overwhelmed and they don't understand it and it, they're, they're finished. They can't pronounce the words or what. Well, what we must do is we have to be persistent. And what I mean by that is if it's somebody that's a new Christian and they're trying to read through the Bible, my recommendation is this. Get a notebook. It doesn't have to be fancy. Any notebook will do. And as you begin to read through the Bible, and maybe you're not trying to go through any particular schedule, you're just simply trying to read through the Bible in the order it's laid out in. And you said, I'm going to read three chapters a day until I'm done, or I'm going to read 20 chapters a day. Whatever it is, you're going to set a goal and you're going to do it. And that's your schedule. That's your plan. 
And so when you start doing that and you're sitting down to read and you're going through it, you're going to come across things that maybe you've seen before and you've got serious questions about or maybe something that you don't understand. The important thing is initially don't stop because those rabbit holes are everywhere and you'll never make it. You'll never make it through the whole Bible. You'll never be able to see the big picture because you'll stop. And you'll go down that corner, you'll go down this corner, and you'll never make it through the Bible. You won't be able to see the big picture because you'll never finish. That's what that notebook's for. You've got that notebook, and so as you're reading through it, and you've got a question, and it's, a, it's probably a very good one, write it down. And write down the verse, write down the passage, write down whatever comes to your mind, what question that you might have, write it down, and that allows you to set that aside. Now it's not going to bother you. You put it on a piece of paper and you can come back to it. Keep on reading. And then what you're able to do is later on when you've gone through the Bible and you have a better understanding, you've been able to read through the whole and you see a bigger picture, now you can go back and you can start mining deeper. And you have a chance for that deeper Bible study, then you can go back and you've got a whole notebook of questions that you can start digging in. And you can start trying to answer. And you can look for resources. And you can try to do that. And then you can work on that. But I, tell, I promise you that if you try to set that schedule and you allow yourself to go here or there, you'll never, ever get through it. So you have to have that persistence and to allow you not to, to jump here or there. You keep on reading. Don't get discouraged. Keep pressing forward. And then you'll be able to come back and circle back to those questions we are to read the Bible completely, and that's important. And again, emphasizing that persistence to move through it. Often, there are those that focus here or there, and they don't have an understanding of the big picture. And for us, if, as New Testament Christians, all of the Bible is important. Though we will be held accountable to the New Testament, we as New Testament Christians believe all of it. The Old Testament is very important. And we need to have a grasp of the Old Testament, how it all fits together, and how it lends to our understanding of the new covenant and the teachings of Christ. And so we study the whole so that we can see the red thread that goes from beginning all the way through the Old Testament that leads us to Jesus Christ. And so we do so. So we have to read completely so that we have that understanding all of the chapters that are there and then we have opportunity to read it over and over again. The Bible says, Matthew 4.4, 4, man does not live by bread alone. Well, by, what, by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We have to have the right attitude. And a couple of the things that we're going to be looking at, in the next few points that we have are going to deal with the mindset. We need to have the right mindset and we need to make sure that we, we study the Bible reverently. When we're studying the Bible, we're not doing it so that we feel um, so that we feel good about ourselves. Like, oh yay, I can pat myself on the back. I, you know, look look how great I am. I I've done this. That's not. That is absolutely not why we are trying to read and study and comprehend the Word of God. Not at all. And so. Um, we want to understand that as we study God's Word, it should not denigrate or degrade into just a mere routine, though we're suggesting that you need to have a routine and a pattern to study the Bible. But what we understand is that as we study it, we study it reverently. Because as we are reading, whether it's a routine and we get up and we're reading however many chapters to try to move through the Bible and read it, then we need to realize that we are studying Literally, the breath of God on the page. That's it. It's inspired of God, the, the Scriptures are. And so we're literally reading His communication. We may pray all day long. We want that God, God please communicate to us. We want God to communicate His will to us. But if we set down the Bible and we never open it up, it's not going to happen. So now here's our opportunity. Here is our great opportunity to allow the Lord to communicate His will to us when we open up the pages of His book and we're reading and studying. It will bless our lives. And so we need to do it with that right type of attitude. And so our regularity of reading should not diminish our respect for the words that are breathed out by God. And to the contrary, a uh, persistent reader is going to become more and more reverent as they read because they're, having, they're going to have a better appreciation for who God is, for the nature of God, for the character of God. 
And as they study more and more and more, they're going to appreciate it so much more as they move forward and study. Also, we need to study and read the Word of God expectantly. And what does that mean? Well, it means that we expect results. It, this is not an empty practice. And you say, well, that kind of seems odd. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, I mean this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17 teaches us that the Scriptures are beneficial. They have a benefit and a value to you and to me. Well, what is that? Well, they, the Scripture itself tells us, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, it's useful for teaching, to, to tell us what we need to know. It'll help to reprove us. It'll help to help us to reject and refute those things that we need to be doing in our lives. It's beneficial to correct us when we're going down the wrong path. And we need that correction when we're in the Word and we're studying it. Then we can know what God's will is. And if we're headed down the wrong path and we're making the wrong choices, we know we can be corrected. We can be set on the right path and know what to turn away from and what to avoid. And God's Word the Scriptures are good for instruction and doing what's right so that we know how to live our lives in accordance with the will of God, to please God, to honor God, and to praise Him in our lives. And it gives us how we are to live and the duties of how we are to serve God and what God expects of us. And so we expect to grow stronger. And that's what we expect. We expect that this Word is going to transform us. In Romans chapter 12, we talked about that this morning. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us not to be conformed to this world, but to transform. But how? Well, what does the passage say? By the renewing of your mind. Renewing how of your mind? It's right here. Those Scriptures. Renewing that mind and allowing your mind to be changed about certain things, about sin, about the nature of sin, about how to live. And when you begin to understand God, His characteristics, His nature, then you want to live in His pattern that He has set for us. You want to follow His Scriptures. And so we expect to grow and to be encouraged and become more fruitful when we study. And we want to read the Bible fervently. Mortimer J. Adler wrote a book and his book is how to read a book <laughs> it kind of sounds funny <laughs> the book he wrote is how to read a book well, that's kind of sounds funny that it's a book on how to read a book but anyway in his book on how to read a book uh he has a chapter on how to be a demanding reader and he begins to talk about the rules for reading yourself to sleep all right what are the rules for reading yourself to sleep? He says, now, you need to get into bed and get into a comfortable position. And then you need to make sure the light is really inadequate to be able to read. So you kind of got to slightly strain your eyes. And then you choose a book that's extremely challenging, terribly difficult, or maybe even boring to some. And you choose that in any event. If you do this, and, and then you choose something that maybe you don't really care about reading, you'll be asleep in a few minutes. That's what he says. And so, even those who are experts in relaxing with a book, they don't even have to wait till it's nighttime. And they don't have to get into a bed. They can go into a public library and sit in a chair and they're out. Now, uh, I, I know that experience. I've done it too many times when I was studying and, and when I was in university. I pick up an accounting book, and I have drooled on many of them. And so uh, I understand that. But when this is no accounting book, and this is no boring thing that we're picking up, I mean, we're literally opening up the mind of God to know what God wants of us. To understand God. To understand His love, His mercy, His compassion. And so that is very different. And so what do we do? We want to stay awake. We don't want to go to sleep. We want to read effectively. And so we want to make sure that when we do so, we focus and we have fervency. That means that we, we're passionate about what we're doing. We care. You know, it's, this is not nonchalant. Well, oh, you know, I'm not going to read my Scripture. You know, I'm behind. I've got to read. I've got to catch up. And let them, no, we need to realize what we are doing. 
the significance that is there, the task that is before us. We take it seriously, and when we do so, then it means something very different to us when we realize the communication and where it is coming from. Because the Bible matters to us, we want to make sure we choose a place that has good lighting and that is not extremely comfortable, otherwise we will fall asleep. And uh, we make sure that we focus because this is soul-saving work. You say, well, how can reading the Bible be soul-saving work? Well, it's your soul that weighs in the balance. It's not soul-saving for anybody else, it's your own. And so we ought to be individuals that are reading fervently with great passion and zeal and with great care, and we read the Bible collectively. It's important to do so. You know, when you're looking for somebody to marry, it's a good idea to sit down and study the Bible with them, to read the Bible together. If you can't do that, then maybe that's not somebody you need to marry. Uh, that would be my recommendation. If you can't sit down and pray together or you can't open up the Bible, then you need to look elsewhere because that person's not going to help you get to heaven. And when we look for a spouse, we want to find somebody that can help us get to heaven. And so that is something that is important. And so even for married couples, for entire families, small groups, congregations, we can read the Bible together, and we are better off for it. October 4, 1982. Now how many remember 1982? All right, Ronald Reagan signed a joint resolution passed by the United States Congress. And if time would allow, I would read it, but I'm going to read the final paragraph. Resolved, the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that the President is authorized and requested to designate 1983 as a National Year of the Bible in recognition of both the formative influence the Bible has been in, for our nation and our national need to study and apply the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. How many of you are aware of that? Raise your hand. Maybe not, but that's something that happened. Would to God that again that would happen. We hope and we pray and we desire that. We pray for our leaders as the Bible commands us to do that one day our nation would de desire to do the same that they would desire to know God, that they would desire to read the Word of God, that they would desire to pattern their lives after the Word of God. That was their resolution then. What is your resolution? What are you resolved to do for the Lord? I hope that as we've studied this, maybe this will help us to understand that Bible reading is significant. It's important. And that we ought to put forth great effort in trying to know God better. Often what we find is there are many people that are claiming to be followers of God. But they don't care enough to open up God's Word. They don't even know what God has to say to them. It's a shame that too many Bibles across our land are sitting and collecting dust. We need more worn out Bibles. If you are not a Christian, will you obey the gospel tonight? You've heard the word, and faith is produced by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Will you allow that faith then to prompt you to believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Son of God? John chapter 8 and verse 32. If you do not, you will die in your sins. You must believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. And will you then change your life in repentance? The Luke chapter 13, 3 and 5 says, Nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We don't want to do that. So we have to repent. We have to change our ways. We have to turn to Jesus Christ. We must be willing to confess with our lips. Romans chapter 10, verse 10 says, With the heart, man confesseth. I mean, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Will you confess what you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ? Confession is a part of that process. Will you be baptized into Christ to submit yourself to Him, to be buried with Him as He was buried in that tomb, to rise to walk in, in newness of life as you come out of the watery grave of baptism, to rise as a new creature, Romans chapter 6, 3 through 6. Will you do that? Will you be born again? 
If you have a need to obey the gospel, the invitation is prepared. We have an invitation song that is ready. If you need to be restored, because you have not been giving your all in knowing God's will for you, and you want to do better, and you want to rededicate your life to God, you can do so. We have an invitation song ready. Won't you come together? We can sing.